So today I am visiting Laurie Shabibi Gallery in Al-Sakal Avenue, which is a hub for a lot of art galleries. And I'm going to be talking to Nadine Fatouh, the gallery manager, about their current uh, show. It's a group show entitled Unseen, which features a lot of Middle Eastern artists or artists that are tied to the region. So I'm quite excited uh, to see what's inside. So Nadine, can you tell us a little bit about your current group show? This is our summer group show. Mm -hmm. It uh, has various works by a roster of our gallery artists. It's called Unseen because it comprises works that we haven't necessarily exhibited in the gallery space. Right. Rather, we've exhibited them in different international art fairs, whether it's Our Basel Hong Kong mm -hmm. or the Dallas Art Fair, as well as um, art fairs in Dubai and FW Art. So the common theme is the fact that even though we may have seen these artists' other works, these specific works we haven't seen right. yet. Yep. And they're all Middle Eastern? Um, they're, well, it's conceptual art by these contemporary artists that have a tie to the region, okay. historically or politically. Okay, cool, interesting, cool. Can't wait to see some of the stuff. This is a Palestinian artist you were telling me about. Yeah, this work is by a Palestinian photographer named Yazan Khalili. Yeah. It's part of a series called Color Correction Camp Series. Yeah. And it's a photograph of Al Amari refugee camp, which is in and around Ramallah. And he's taken a photograph of it and color corrected it. Um, it's, a, it's an expression of how the, the trauma and the loss of the right. homeland in 1948 and he color corrects it almost as though a child is filling in a coloring book um, to try to bring a possibility and hope for a future. It looks like paint on the actual buildings, it doesn't look like it's been photoshopped obviously or color collected, corrected as you say. Exactly. I mean the colors are very attractive and they kind of draw you in but when you go up close you notice that there is so much rubble and not destruction but abandonment. It looks like it's actually an abandoned site. There's no care, which is an interesting contrast from the colors that he's chosen to use, right? right? Yeah, it's very reflective of the economic status and the political situation that they're living in. Yeah. A very sort of dire living situation. What's interesting as well is that he used really, really bright colors because if you look at the back of buildings at the back, that, those are the actual colors yeah, exactly. of the building. So when you compare them to the foreground, he's used not subtle colors, but very bright, highlighted colors, sort of similar to the ones that you would see in... Europe or South America, yeah. it gets confused for those uh, cities all the time. Do you think as well he's maybe making a statement of this is what Palestine could have been? Yeah, he's trying to offer that kind of sense of hope mm. for the Palestinian people. These three works are... Are Khatam-based works, which is a Persian micro-mosaic. Actually, the technique came from China about 700 years okay. ago and was refined by Persian craftsmen. And it's works by an Iranian artist named Farhad Ahronia. Okay. And he's based between Shiraz in Iran and Sheffield in the UK. What Khatam is, is Persian micro-mosaic. They take these filaments of different organic materials, different metals like brass and gold and silver, mm -hmm. as well as camel bone and wood, and kind of like cut them at the cross section. All right. It sort of reveals all these really intricate geometric shapes. All of us, Middle Easterns, Arabs, uh, Iranians, we know these patterns, we know these, this technique, we've seen it in our homes. Right. It's, it's very, I don't want to use the word common, but we, we, we see them in our homes and on frames. However, he's taken them, something that's quite traditional, and put them in these geometric shapes that are very planned, very minimal. There is such a contrast between the white plain background wow. and then you have the intricate detail. However, you can tell from his placement and the composition that it's also very well thought out. I think it's natural for the eye to always try and make recognizable shapes. Right, or associations. associations. Images you've seen. Exactly. I mean, instantly we have the association because this, these patterns, we know them, they remind us of things, you know. I mean, for me, we used to have so many of these. Embellished, like exactly, domestic objects. Exactly, exactly, around, around the house. This is the same 
artist, Farhad. Farhad Abrania, and he does these um, smaller embroidered portrait works. Yeah. Uh, they're of different personalities and characters that kind of have or lead double lives. It looks very different from his other work that we just saw. But at the same time, you can see there is the same DNA of the artist, meaning that the work is, again, very intimate, it's small, there is a lot of attention to detail. Explain to me the, the reason why he decided to use embroidery. The canvas is, uh, you can see the kind of cross stitch, and that's what's symbolic of that double identity. Mm -hmm. And so this work is of Josephine Baker, yeah. who was an American dancer and actress, and she kind of rose to fame in the 1920s in Broadway and mm -hmm. subsequently moved to Paris and she sort of aided the French resistance. So she was also a spy? Yeah, so she yeah. was also a spy and she would kind of sneak in like uh, secret messages mm -hmm. and sheet music as mm -hmm. well as photographs of German military installations and customs officers would search her because of her celebrity. Mm -hmm. He seems to be quite uh, concerned with contrast, for example, I mean in the other works it's this east-west way of making art, right? With here it's these personalities that have these very different uh, contrasting parts that, that want someone who's very public right. and someone who's a very private secretive part. Right. Who are some of the other women if you remember that he... So he had Matahari who was killed by the firing squad yeah. in France for being a spy as well. He did a few works about Cleopatra yeah. and Agatha Christie. Oh because she aided her husband on yeah. the archaeological digs. And what's interesting as well is that traditionally embroidery is a very, I guess you would say, feminine, right. crafty kind of art form, right? It, you wouldn't see embroidery in, in a gallery. He's, he's a male and he's using these very feminine techniques um, to tell a story and also traditionally embroidery kind of just shows you a scene, very static, right. still lives. But this, in a way, it's interesting because it's the way he's uh, he's, he's embroidered, it's actually moving, it's alive in a way. Right, it's very dynamic, exactly. but he's also portraying all these strong kind of female personalities which he likes to convey in his work. Yeah. I noticed this as well when I first walked in because it's a lot of little smaller pieces of work that make one bigger piece of work. This so. is a work called Memory Drawings by okay. Shukur Puyan. It's of an 11th century Muqaynas um, Dome of Sharaf al Dawla, which is a Shiite mausoleum in Mosul, Iraq. Mm -hmm. And he's very interested in its architectural form and he always wanted to visit it. Um, but sadly, it was destroyed by ISIS in October 2014, so he wasn't able to. The reason why he was very interested in its sculpture is it kind of um, resembles a cubist sculpture, which kind of pre predates um, European modernism by right. a thousand years. So he never actually got to visit the site before it was destroyed. Right. So he's he made these drawings based on from his memory. So he had a photograph of it pinned over his desk in his studio. Right. But he decided to take it down and every week sit down and draw it from memory. You can tell that he's struggling to remember small details like in that drawing or in some cases he forgets or he gives up completely or he's only half shaded or in this case here this drawing it's shaded almost perfectly so you're seeing the struggles of memory of trying to recall something that doesn't exist anymore. Right, so this work is really about human preservation and you kind of see how our mind doesn't accurately document and it sort of mm. references oral history as well as the drawings of ancient explorers um, and the kind of cross-fertilization of ideas. Yeah, what's ironic as well looking at this is that the way he set it up, it looks like a shrine to something. You know, in the same way that we put photographs of people up on the wall, the way that they're organized, there are these little frames as well. It's a shrine to it's a shrine to a shrine, right? Because this was a structure that was a religious site for many devout people uh, that's destroyed now. And it's interesting as well because he has 39 pieces and he's organized them in a way that there is a space for one more piece, the 40th piece. I'm not sure if that number is significant to him. But your eye kind of travels and you think, okay, where's the 40th piece? Where, what happens next? But we don't have that answer because, like you say, memory isn't something we can rely on. We don't have any, any um, reference anymore because of the, 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 the structure's been destroyed, which is, it makes it actually quite a sad piece. So 
I remember you guys had a solo show of Andres' work, right? Yes, it was um, in 2014. Why don't you tell us a little bit about, about the series first, or about this specific work? So, Dries Wadahi is an Algerian artist, mm -hmm. and he's also an architect, so that informs his work. And what he does is he travels around different cities and takes photographs of different architectural structures and buildings and he uses those photographs as pre references for his paintings. Mm -hmm. In this particular work he's kind of applied these gestural marks to kind of blur um, the reality depicted through these photographs as well as um, images of buildings that he is recalling from memory. Right. What I like about his work, what draws me to it is that for something that might seem like you know, there is a minimal use of color or a, a smaller color choice. There's a lot happening and I think it, your eye kind of darts everywhere. For example, his painting techniques, his layering, the fact that he's an architect really just makes sense because if you look at the foreground, the way he uses paint is very, uh, not gestural, but it's, it's, it's very, there's a lot of movement happening, whereas you compare it to the background where the image of the buildings is very static, very precise, organized, precise, precise, exactly. And then you have this section in the middle where the lines are blurred. You're seeing this use of paint in the foreground becoming the structured uh, use of paint in the, in the background. And the foreground where he has, in the, in the top where he has this grid, again, it, like he said, it puts us on the outside looking in and this idea of looking through different windows and different frames and looking at, looking at all these different shapes and different facets. And then even you have these small details Oh, it could be his hand, it could be he's, he's pressed something against the paint. Do you see they look like little branches or little roots? Do you notice that? Yeah, it's almost like how the paint is in yeah. the canvas. It's really interesting. I like I love looking at these little details and seeing what else I can find. You can also see that the painting is absent, a void of any figures or people. And he's trying to sort of convey the idea of this um, alienation urban alienation in our contemporary societies. I remember these works very clearly because you had a solo exhibition of his uh, of his pieces in 2013, yeah? Right. Yeah. So do you want to tell me a little bit about the artist and about the series? So this is a work by Asad Falwell, he's an LA-based artist. Mm -hmm. For the last few years he's been doing this ongoing series about Les Femmes d'Algerie. What does that translate to? Um, that translates to the women of Algiers. Okay. And what he's depicting through these paintings are these Algerian women, freedom fighters, who fought alongside the men to liberate Algeria from France. Mm -hmm. So it was the period between 1952 and 1962. So these women weren't celebrated as well as they should have been celebrated. So during, yeah, so they were captured and kind of persecuted and imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And when they were released after the war, um, they couldn't hold any government positions. So instead of being celebrated, they were kind of just persecuted and forgotten basically mm -hmm. and what he's trying to do is kind of pay an homage to them yeah commemorate them by using this very quasi-religious um, imagery so it kind of resembles a lot of like shrines mm -hmm. and it has a lot of islamic art influences so are these specific women is he drawing these from his imagination does he use photo references to paint these women so he's used photo references okay he's collected a lot of photos of these women at different points in time whether they were on trial and he paints them in monochrome you always see them kind of either crying mm. or bleeding and he sets them against this very colorful and highly detailed background they look like stained glass windows you see in churches. Um, he uses, it looks like backbreaking work because there's so much detail in the background and he's made it all flow or everything fits in like a, like a, like a, like a kaleidoscope. I think it's really interesting as well that he is the second male artist that you have that's actually exploring the female narrative, female history. I love them, I think. They are sad, they are interesting, that you can look at one for a long time and just keep seeing all this detail. There's almost a sense of movement with the imagery in the background. There is 
a feeling of embroidery as well. Um, and there's collage. Collage. See, um, yeah. Different, also smaller photographs of women added to the background as well. New footage claiming to portray the King of Pop has surfaced. Huang Le Fashion, the King of Pop. Et maintenant, revenons sur cette histoire qui refuse de s'éteindre et à ces milliers de photos de Monsieur Jackson. The hashtag MJ Lives has been trending for a record-breaking seven consecutive days on social networking site Twitter. Okay, what's happening in here? That's Michael Jackson, right? Right. So that, this is a short film by a Rocky Finnish artist named Anna Dean. It's okay. actually based between Helsinki and Finland and Amman. And in this film, he's resurrected Michael Jackson and he's come back to give this sit-down interview where he sort okay. of reveals existential truths about the afterlife in front of all these fans that have gathered in Times Square. I mean, I'm a huge Michael Jackson fan and this is such an interesting piece of work because it I mean, Michael Jackson is a massive pop culture icon and it can speak to so many people as a, as a work of art. But what's striking to me is the production value here. This is, this is crazy. There's so many people and special effects. Special effects. Like an actor impersonating Michael Jackson. So is this a Michael Jackson impersonator or is it? It's an actor playing mm. Michael Jackson. And if you listen closely to the interview, you realize that Michael Jackson is responding um, with a compilation of different lyrics from his most popular songs. So he only answers in his lyrics, basically. And what it's commenting on is about the celebrity culture mm. and how we kind of idolize celebrities and consider them like modern day messiahs. And we with the whole resurrection thing coming back and yeah. telling the people. And we're influenced by their values, their ideas. Yeah. I think especially these days, more so even when Michael Jackson was in his, the height of his fame, we're obsessed with celebrity and we, I think, Google more about celebrities than we do about our own spiritual well-being. And watching this video now, seeing how these people are together and looking at Michael and interacting, it's almost like looking at a scene from a church or a religious gathering, right? Right. Yeah. I think that's all we can say really, right? Yeah. yeah.